So I have some just easy slides I said. Uh, we look at trends in cybersecurity, information security and privacy. Um, I have eight trends because it has to be a round number, my first binary joke. So there is eight trends I can see um, in cybersecurity. And the first, you already heard several people working on IoT security. So the Internet of Things is coming. Um, what is interesting is it means many things to many people. Um, for some people, it means tiny processors that are embedded maybe in the environment, maybe for agriculture in the land, maybe in our bodies. Um, so some people call this smart dust. For other people, the IoT is smart cities, an entire city which is wired with sensors, cameras, uh, Wi-Fi access points, uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, 6G, whatever, to put communication um, everywhere. So it can mean tiny things or a huge uh, system of tiny things. Um, and if you want to find out um, how fast it will grow, well, there will be many, many devices. Um, so today there is 7 billion people on the earth. There is probably about 14 billion devices now on the internet. And most of us um, carry two or three devices on the internet. And then there is, of course, the other half population has no internet yet. But so there is many bold predictions being made. Um, for example, Gardner predicted that in 2013, that by 2020, there would be 26 billion devices on the internet. Um, Ericsson claimed um, about 50 billion in 2010. Cisco said 50 billion would be, this is next year, all my predictions for next year, but made five to six years ago. Intel said 200 billion un units by 2020. IDC said 212.432 billion units. Um, so you see, um, it can only mean that they have a different definition of IoT or they have no clue of making predictions. Right? <laughs> so there is even more interesting predictions like Ericsson. This is more recent, made last year. They expect 18 billion IoT devices in 2022. Of course, probably more realistic because made more recently. Um, and if you want the most outrageous prediction was IBM in 2012. They claimed 1 trillion connected devices by 2050. <laughs> I don't know who that in IBM did this, but... Um, but I think the message is clear that IoT means different things to different people. Um, it can mean vehicle to vehicle, it can mean factory automation, it can mean building automation, smart cities, and so on. Um, but one thing we know that the IoT will be intrusive, stealthy, and <coughs> unavoidable. So the problem, of course, is if you make a city smart, you can no longer avoid it. You can't see these cameras because cameras become smaller and smaller. And I guess we'll get a talk later. We have some water here. Unless you were living on a different planet, you know that since last year we have GDPR. And one of the core concepts of GDPR is that well, there is many <coughs> ways companies can process your information, but the main way is consent. You consent to actually have your data processed. There is other grounds, like for example, that is necessary. But I think it's very interesting. What, what does it mean if Antwerp is a smart city? Does it mean then if you drive into the city, you consent to actually give all your data to the smart city to make it smarter? Or do they argue that actually because they're a smart city, it's necessary to operate it that they actually process all your data, right? So I think it, it's going to be very interesting once these smart cities get deployed on a large scale and then data protection authorities will have to give their opinion. I think it will become very interesting because data processing will reach new heights. Of course, we know things can go wrong. Um, in 2007, Dick Cheney got actually his pacemaker um, replaced because he had a pacemaker or he didn't want a pacemaker with a wireless interface because he was worried people would actually kill him from a distance. Um, we have done quite some research on this. Since then there have been new generations of pacemakers and I can only tell you they're worse. So we, when we now get a new device from the hospital um, in the lab, we can hack it typically in a few hours. That's the time to hack it. Um, if you talk to doctors about this, so I told them if I get a pacemaker in the next 10 or 20 years, I will ask the wireless interface to be disabled. 
And they told me, you better keep it on because 2% of the devices stop working at some moment. And if we don't monitor them all the time, we can't tell you when you, they stop working. So once you get your device, most of you are still far away from that, but uh, think about this. And probably in 20 years, we all have some devices implanted. And we got the Stuxnet story. It was enough in the press. I don't have to repeat about this. This is 2010. Um, Iranian enrichment. Then as a revenge, um, a year later, the Iranians actually uh, probably spoofed GPS and were in this way able to down a US drone. And then, of course, they took it apart and they showed it to the television. Um, you have the hacks in Ukraine, or some people call it cyber war incidents, where Russian hackers brought down the power network twice. And it was in um, 2015 and 2016. And then high profile was the Jeep hack. Researchers had already um, been showing cars, modern cars are easy to hack. But I think the first hack that actually uh, hit the general public was when hackers remotely were able to actually completely control a Jeep. Um, and the interesting thing is they don't do this um, by putting a bug or so in there. They actually go to the entertainment system, which has a wireless interface. And from this, they go to the rest of the system. And so they were able to um, dump the Jeep in a ditch with the driver still in there. Um, and then in 2016, this is already almost three years ago, um, we actually saw how the IoT was used to create a DDoS attack to actually send many, many communications to single sites to bring them down. And that shows a very interesting point that even if you don't care about your webcam or your doorbell, it can actually become part of a network and be used to hack others. So IoT security is a collective problem, just like traffic security a collective is a collective problem. So I don't want to tell you more scare stories, but it's clear that Times will be interesting, and then the Chinese definition, where you say, may your day is interesting, is if you wish your enemy many difficulties. I think uh, our times will be interesting. But these devices are being deployed massively. Um, they are cheap in most cases. They don't have expensive processors. Um, for some reason, people always put a web interface on these devices. It's something which is a mystery to me, but they have to have a web interface, which then, of course, creates a large attack surface. You'll hear more about it. Hard to update, for example, in the Mirai case, some devices were known not to be updatable at all. So even if you know about the problem and the root password is easy to know, it's published everywhere, you can't even update the root password. So you can only throw them out, more or less. Uh, there is insecure programming, and uh, we have more about software security later, and also lack of expertise. Uh, it's clear that there is a large shortage of experts in cybersecurity, and so this course tries to work on this. Um, but I think it's a global shortage, and I don't know whether you should believe predictions, but large players speak of a shortage of several million people in cybersecurity. It's also not something where there is a civil bullet. Um, it's a very complex ecosystem with complex supply chains, many players, um, and many things being put together, so very fragmented. And then there is also sometimes a contradiction between security and safety. Of course, if your car can be hacked, it's no longer safe. But to give you a simple example, um, if your brake command goes over the CAN bus, ideally it should be authenticated, right? And not any hacker can send a command and your car slams its brakes. On the other hand, of course, if the authentication chip is broken or the key is lost, well, that should then all the braking be disabled because you cannot authenticate the brake command. So there you see this trade-off on the one hand, you don't want anybody to give a brake command but you don't want a, a bug in a processor or some processor breaking down, making it, you don't want to make it impossible to actually break the car, right? So this is sometimes difficult decisions have to be made. The question is who is responsible? Um, and this has been studied already by um, 10, 15 years ago, there is a new workshop being created twice on economics of security. So, because what we saw in security is that there is much more attention for it. I mean, if you were working in security in the 90s, people thought you were a bit of a weird geek. Uh, now they still think it, but at least it's in the media every day, so it must be important what you do, right? That's a very big difference between 20 years ago. Um, but so what we didn't understand was that we did quite some, we wrote papers, hundreds and thousands of papers. We actually built systems. We made open source code available. 
um, and we saw actually things getting worse. Okay, so or at least in the sense that if you buy a webcam today, you can all go to Fnac today or uh, you on online order a webcam. I think chances are very high that this webcam will be highly insecure and that you give it to our team or the Distinet team that will take it apart uh, completely, not, not much will remain of it, in the sense that there will be many security flaws in there. So this has been studied by economists and it's called the market for lemons. Now this is not a lemon, in, a lemon in this definition is this here, and lemon is a US term for a used car. So if you move to the US, like I did as a postdoc and you have no money, then you, you can't afford a shiny car, so you go to one of those parking lots and you can buy cars there for a couple of thousand dollars. And they all look shiny, but you know what's gonna happen. If you buy it and you drive around the block, then the fender will fall off. And if you accelerate on the next hill, then the engine will start smoking, right? That's because the car was in an accident. And if you're really unlucky, it will break into two, but okay. So that's called a lemon. And this is very well known, and because of this problem that you can't tell as a cons consumer whether this is a good car or not, the prices are pretty low. You can actually buy for very low money a car, but chances are very, very big it's a lemon, so you actually wasted your money. And the same thing actually happens in security. So if you buy a webcam, and even after this course, you can go to FNAC and look at the things, and maybe you will recognize TLS something, or web whatever, but still, how can you evaluate whether it's secure or not? And the answer is you can't unless you give it to a lab and they spent several hours, several days, several weeks to make a report. So in fact, you don't know which webcams are secure or not. So you're not gonna pay more for one that says I am secure because you don't believe it anyway. And so because you will not pay more, actually the vendors will not invest in security. And so they will all be equally insecure because as a vendor, if you invest in security, you will not sell more, but if you invest in a nice red box around it or some shiny ears of a cat on top of it, you may sell more of them. And that's the reality of security. So it has to do with economics. And there is also the tragedy of the commons, the fact that we don't want to invest in somebody else's security. So most people don't care too much about Mirai. If you go to the street and do a street interview and ask people, do you care about Mirai? They will say, what? Okay, do you care about the DDoS attack? What? So why would you actually care about this? It's not your problem. It's everybody else's problem. Um, and so this is also insecurity. And it also not only plays among common users, also among companies. There is actually little incentive to be a good citizen and to invest more in cybersecurity because your products will be more expensive or your service will be more expensive. And in fact, it's very hard to prove that you're more secure. So it's not what you have to do in this case, you have to have regulation. But of course, this is a field that changes very quickly and it's very complex. So it's not clear what you should regulate. So politicians are very reluctant. Um, I guess what we can have is that Trump will make a regulation someday, he will tweet some regulation on IoT security. In general, it's not so easy, right? It's not that there is a silver bullet and that you say, do the following three things and then everything will be secure, just comply with the law. So to come back to economics, these are numbers that scare me. Um, and I don't know whether they're true, but they're produced by Gartner, so they must be true. So this is three years ago, Gartner produced numbers on IoT markets. And so Gartner was not so far off in their prediction. So Gartner predicted by 2020, IoT market for devices would be $3 trillion, which is an enormous growth um, from less than a trillion dollar um, when they made the prediction in 2014, okay? So this sounds good because it's a new business. There is lots of investment. Now the bad news, Gartner's estimate of the security budget is one half. Not a trillion dollar, but billion dollars. So more or less this means that if you buy a webcam for $30, that the budget for security is less than half a cent. Okay, this is really scary. Then they updated this a year later and they said, well, half of this half of a cent will actually go to legacy problems, it will not be to secure new things. And then last year they actually made a bit a more optimistic update. They said that actually in 2018, the uh, security budget will already be 1.5 billion IoT security budget, so it was actually three times more than what they predicted, and it will grow to 3 billion in 2020. So now you have three cents to secure your webcam. Good luck. I hope really this is wrong, 
but this is really what we're looking at. Um, if you look at the budget per device, it's overall not security budget is about $150 or $100. So this is webcams, uh, home devices, and so on. There's a broad range of things. But so it's really scary that only a tenth of a percent is devoted to security. And so there is no magic bullet. I will not go into detail here, but you can read the NISA report about this. Of course, securing something is about management, managing the ecosystem, um, looking at IT security architecture, and there will be somebody from IBM coming to speak about security architectures, administration, identity access management, maintenance, physical security. Uh, it's a broad range of things. In this course, we're going to focus mostly on securing the communication with the device and securing the software and the web interfaces, so the system security. But there is much more security about people and processes. And so you have to establish many processes around this. Um, and this is not the focus of this course. There is other courses that focus more on this. We focus more on technology aspects. But it's a complex task. And given the budgets we have, I think it's an uphill battle. One thing you can do is you can standardize security. That actually helps to make it cheaper. And it's also necessary for interoperability. Um, what you see here is a diagram made two years ago by uh, IoT, the EU IoT initiative. Um, and you see that there is actually a whole zoo of standards um, and security and privacy standards. So you, I think you would need several PhD students to even go to all the meetings. So this is also a very big problem. As I mentioned, fragmentation. Um, it's kind of almost impossible to even follow what is happening uh, because things move very quickly. In, and very often it's closed for us, so you can't even as academic participate. Um, but I think that's a very big challenge. So there have been efforts, and I will not give a lecture here about law, but California actually voted a law last September um, that actually requires by beginning of next year, it's a very pragmatic law, it was criticized heavily, but says more or less, get your basics right. You can't have default passwords anymore or default sysadmin passwords anymore. Um, <laughs> You have to have a password before you can actually change the settings. These kind of basic things. Um, is it going to be enough? At least it's going to increase awareness and going to force a basic level of investment. Then you have the UK. So the UK did not wait for Europe. They had their own initiative. But it's a code of practice. Because in fact, actually, because they're part of EU, they can't make a law. Because clearly, the other nations would say this is actually um, damaging or changing the internal market. So they just give you some general advice and give 13 guidelines for IoT security. I think it's a very good step. And then Europe, um, the slides are still draft, but by now it has been approved, so the Cybersecurity Act. So Europe has created the Cybersecurity Act. And for some reason, the people in Brussels believe that everything will be solved by certification. And so what's going to happen is, um, this is already clear, that the common criteria uh, will be pushed through by several member states. Um, although we know that the common criteria don't work, they're way too expensive, way too slow, and they favor large companies who are, can hire p people who produce meters of paper, but not secure systems. But in spite of this, it's already like written that in next year or in two years, um, the larger member states will force upon us as a European standard common criteria. The smaller member states are working on more pragmatic standards like for IoT. Uh, but that's happening. But I'm a bit worried it's going to give rise to a lot of paperwork, but not lost security. That's my main concern. Um, for now, the scheme is voluntary, which also consumers are not so happy about because it still means that you will be able to buy insecure webcams and secure webcams, which have the label. Um, so I think this is by itself is a whole matter of debate. So probably it's too heavyweight, and I'm skeptical it will work, but this is what Europe has chosen. So I think what's going to happen in 20 years when we look back at 2019, we will look at the IoT today and we look at, as we look today at the Chevrolet Corvair, it's a beautiful car, right? And you can even paint your house pink and it fits with it. Um, but of course, if you look inside in this car, there is of course no seat belts, there is no airbag, there is no ABS, no ESP. And I guess you know what happens if you're in an accident, right? There is a pin coming out of the steering wheel, and you will be in your seat forever. <laughs> so I think this is how our systems are today. They may be shiny, they may be beautiful, but we will look at them and say, how could people use these kind of systems? How was this possible? 
right? And I think this is how we will look at. Okay, this is a bit long on the first trend, so we'll move now to the second trend. The second trend, I guess, uh, again, unless you've been on another planet, you've heard of big data and AI, the big buzzwords of the past, I would say, five to eight years. And so Flanders also has a big uh, initiative for AI. It will be 30 million euro per year invested. So, but we first focus on the big data part. So, I guess today we all put our data in the cloud. And that's what we all do. Our smartphones put our photo in the cloud, our email is in the cloud, all our services are in the cloud. So, I gave a lecture for the broader public a couple of weeks ago and then somebody uh, raised their hand and said, Professor, what is that, the cloud? Okay. And so I said, it's very simple. I will use the definition of Richard Stallman. The cloud is someone else's computer. That is what the cloud is. Some people have decided that they will your computer is for you. And that actually, this is a lot cheaper and more effective because they're much better at this and they have economy of scale. Um, but that's more or less what it is. Of course, you can also run your own cloud. I'm simplifying here. You can do this as well and there is big benefits. But in general, for society, we now put our data on the computers of somebody else. In spite of the fact that we know from Snowden that if your data ends up in the US cloud, it ends up with the NSA. But we just keep, six years later, claim that this does not happen. I just move on and deny it. So, by the changes in IT, so Moore's law keeps working. Processors keep getting faster for the same cost. We can process more data. Uh, we can store more data, we can get more data, this keeps growing. And many people have predicted the end of more already many times, but it keeps happening. And things are changing, but it keeps happening. And so data volumes are now so big, and the speed at which it arrives is so big, it's a broad variety of data. We can now have sound data, video data, but also data where people are, where cars are, uh, but also data from processors and so on. And so the idea is we're going to make a much better world with this because we can improve traffic, we can improve medicine um, because we can find out what works, we can find out what you're eating, where you're driving, uh, what you want to do in your free time and if somehow all this data is available we can make the world a better place. And I guess we can but of course as a security and privacy person I have to put some warnings um, because of course today as we use the cloud you must have seen this quote that all these free services, of course, you are not actually the customer, you're actually the product being sold or your data is being sold. And there have been quite some noise in the press and quite some debate about the power of Google and Apple and Microsoft and Amazon. They have too much power. Um, and I guess the hope of some people is that the GDPR will finally give governments a tool to go after these companies. What most people don't know is there is a much more complex ecosystem. So in fact, you have here the advertisers, the people who want to sell you stuff. And then here you have the publishers, this is the websites, news agencies, uh, the places you visit. And so it's not only these large players, there's actually dozens and dozens of companies, and this is a graph of a few years old, that actually analyze your data, process your data, and try to optimize advertising. And so in principle by GDPR, you have to give consent to all these companies. Uh, and you can ask them to delete your data and so on. But the thing is, these companies appear and disappear at a very high rate. So I would bet that probably a third of these companies no longer exists. And there is dozens of new companies since the last two years. So more or less, as a consumer, it's even impossible to figure out who processes your data. So in that sense, GDPR is um, becoming a, a theoretical law. If you go to a security conference, this is already happening two or three years in a row. Um, there they see big data as the way to transform security. So they say more or less, well, in your company, you have thousands or ten thousands or hundred thousands of devices. If you don't know where all these devices are and what they do, how can you be secure? So you actually have to monitor all your devices uh, in a central system. Um, and if you can't do this, well, how can you be secure? Okay. The second mantra is, you have these cryptographers keep saying, encrypt your data. You have the software security people keep saying, write secure software and make secure configuration of your web server. It's too difficult anyway. You only have a few cents anyway. Just monitor everything. 
all the time. And if you do that, you will actually find the bad guys and it's a much cheaper way to get secured. And that's more or less what is now being sold. And this shift has been happening over the last 10 years. The emphasis is not on prevention, the emphasis is on detection, but of course also privacy problems. And the idea is then, of course, now if you put such a SOC or such a SIEM and you monitor everything that's happening in your company or maybe in a larger network, it's too much data. There is so many potential attacks, so many incidents. So you're now going to use AI to analyze this. Okay, so this is data analytics to actually find the bad guys and stop them. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do this, but of course it has privacy implications and you will never catch the smart bad guys because they will always behave differently. And the question is, can you really uh, do this using learning, um, learn what is good and what is bad behavior? Um, and of course, also it changes the whole architecture because it means you have like the big brother built in. Some side comment on AI, that of course, um, AI also has privacy implications and people only started recently looking at this. Um, for example, your training data may leak so you have this large neural network and people say, oh, this is built up by analyzing the medical data of uh, one million users. So it's not possible to find one user in there. It turns out that actually it is possible sometimes to find specific user data in such a network, which has learned from one user. Uh, if this user has specific behavior, it may show up in the network. You have leakage of models. Maybe Nigel will speak about this. Uh, but in general, you have this question of algorithmic fairness and if you read one book this summer on the beach I would say read weapons of math destruction it's a very very nice book about um, how AI can be abused or misused and how the way classification works actually can be very damaging for society because it seems we tolerate behavior from AI which we would not tolerate from users I mean, as users we can't discriminate uh, this is in our laws but you may have seen this incident where classification algorithm of Google classified African-Americans as gorillas. And that gives you just one example, shocking as it is, of how dangerous it is, is to actually rely on AI. Um, to the credit of the legal people, GDPR has something about algorithmic transparency and has some specifications. They actually more or less you have the right to learn how decisions were made. Uh, but I would say good luck to enforce that. Go knock on the door of Google and say, how did you make decisions about why I got showed this ad versus that ad? or why I was shown this restaurant and not that, not that restaurant, good luck, okay? So it's not clear this is an enforceable law, but I think it's something to think about. So these AI algorithms create a filter bubble and we've now seen the political implications of this. This is way beyond um, my reach. I will not talk too much about this, but I think it's clearly, uh, it has a flip side as well. And I guess you may have heard about adversarial machine learning so the point is the following, since about 2011-12, we can finally recognize objects. So there was a breakthrough um, in computational power and methods to actually recognize objects. It was a, seen as a very hard problem. And before deep learning was invented, research and vision had to do a lot of programming and tuning to distinguish a cat from a dog. It was months of work or years of work to teach a computer the difference. And then suddenly deep learning came and it was possible to actually, with many, many examples available with big data and computational power to actually recognize cats and dogs and whatever. But then it was discovered if you add a little bit of noise to the picture, all these pictures on the left are recognized as ostriches. Okay. And there is a beautiful paper by Adi Shamir and Or Dunkelman and, and um, A.R. Ronan, who is actually now visiting us and Or was visiting us where they actually show that for certain classifiers they can construct very easily for any class an image as close to it in a different class. There is still some limitations to the work, but more or less we now understand that these deep learning algorithms cannot be robust and that most countermeasures which have been proposed against these attacks are actually completely worthless. So this is actually very worrying because if you put, for example, a small sticker on a stop sign then the AI algorithm in your car will recognize it as a speed limit of 90 kilometers per hour. So actually, people also have shown that they can spoof the Tesla sensors, they can actually make the thing, the lines go left when they go right and so on. So it's going to be an interesting world. So when AI meets privacy and security, uh, it's going to be fun. The area will be the most development, and I think to some extent we're doing some research together with uh, Yves Moreau and some other people on this. 
um, is the bio world. Because when the first DNA was sequenced in 2001, it cost $100 million, and it took years to do. And what you see in white here is Moore's law, improvement by a factor of two every 18 months. So the cost of sequencing DNA actually has gone down much, much more, and now it costs only a few thousand dollars, or even less, depending on what you do. And so in the end, we're going to be able to hack life, and so we'll all be living forever if we don't walk under buses or if we don't uh, get fooled by the wrong traffic signs. But so that's more or less what the doctors are now trying to do, is to, of course, first cure diseases and then maybe um, <coughs> hack life and make us all live forever. So it's changing a lot. For now, there's kind of cheap versions of this where part of your genes are being sequenced and this is used to discover your ancestry. Or you may also get some indications of your risks for certain diseases. Um, this is interesting. But of course, the question is, what if insurance companies get hold of this data? Or in the US now, many cold cases have been solved um, by using DNA. Uh, people have voluntarily submitted. And of course, it's not the problem here is that maybe you kill somebody, you never give your DNA, you're not really so stupid, but if your family members do, that's enough. And so that's also a collective problem. So in fact, your whole extended family, if one of them gives away DNA information to one of these websites or anywhere, your DNA leaks also partially. And that may be enough to trace or identify you. So I think we'll have to think a lot about what to do here, and there is no magic solutions. Third development, so it sounds all a bit pessimistic, is a good development, I think. Um, it's something which is called edge networks. So people have figured out that for the things we want to do, like real-time autonomous vehicles, if something pops up in front of your car, your car cannot make a connection to Google, upload a video to Google, let the algorithm there run and decide what it is, and then send me back, oh, um, it's only a shadow, you can go full speed, or no, it's actually a person, or it's a box on the road you have to break. I guess you all figure out that the internet is not fast enough for this, so this has been understood very well, so we need low latency processing, which means local processing. Uh, that's one reason. Uh, the other reason, if you have 50 billion devices and they all send a little bit of communication every second or every millisecond to the cloud, well, the cloud will be clocked and the network will be clocked. You just can't deal with it, right? It's just, <coughs> even if they only send a few bytes or a few hundred bytes, it's just too much data. So the architecture will have to change and there will be nodes in the middle called the edge, or some people call it the fog, where you actually will be processing data locally. And this, of course, is good because it gives lower latency, which we need for autonomous devices. And of course, it's also good for privacy because data stays local. Now, of course, if you hear the big companies speak about this, they say, yes, yes, we keep the detailed information local, but all the intelligence, what you're doing, who you're meeting and whatever, that, of course, will send to the cloud for security purposes. So it's not clear, actually, that these edge devices will not become just spies, just like you have these spies in your pocket. They will also be edge routers spying on you. Um, so it's not clear, actually, it will give more privacy, but the good thing is it can give more privacy. It depends on the decisions we take. So, as I said, low latency, low communication overhead, and potentially decentralization, but maybe less secure, and because they can be attacked physically, and less controlled. So, moving on, trend four. Bigger data means bigger breaches. It's kind of amazing. So, on the one hand, this world seems to be evolving in the right direction. Few people are hungry, more people get educated, more people get on the internet. Seems to be a good thing. So, on the one hand, I think the world is progressing using technology in the right direction. On the other hand, it's kind of amazing how bad humans are in forecasting black swan <laughs> events or disasters. This is Deepwater Horizon, the thing that exploded. Uh, which could never happen. We also had Fukushima, something that could never happen. Um, we had 2008 financial crash, that could never happen. So we seem to be very optimistic about things not going wrong. Trust me, I know what I'm doing, and then the whole thing explodes. And so if you want to find out how bad it is with data, then you should go to this website. Um, information is beautiful. And look at the biggest breaches. It's an interactive site, so you can play with what you see. And so 
The bigger the bridge, the bigger the circle. Um, if you're looking for Belgian bridges, it starts only at 35 million, so you will, you will not appear in all of them. So this is, this is the real big bridges. And of course, your data may be in there because LinkedIn is there. Yahoo is there. If you stay with a Marriott Hotel, will be there. Twitter had a bridge. So this is the 10 million, 20 million plus range. So NMBS losing all the data on you. This will not even make, make it on this website. Um, as an academic and as an engineer, I'm kind of amazed that given that there's so many bridges, why is it still allowed to store all this data? Because it's kind of, we've proven now, and this website goes back, you can go back in time, not too far, but I think few, several more years, we've proven we're incapable of protecting data. We have demonstrated incompetence of doing it, but still we keep doing more of it, in the hope that someday it's not going to happen. Some of these things are pretty um, sensitive stuff. For example, there was um, a medical site, medical information. Uh, there was Friend Finder. Maybe you don't care about it, but Friend Finder is a friend network for people who are married. Let me put it like this, adult dating sites. Um, so you can imagine it has quite some implications. This data gets breached. Um, but there is also quite some government information, like the voters in Turkey, Philippines. Um, and I think this is only a small bullet. It's 2015, US OPM, but it's a very important one. US OPM is US Office of Personnel Management. It sounds very innocent, but it's actually 21 million people in the US with a security clearance. So more or less everybody who is important in the US, their data have been breached. Um, of course, it's very hard to attribute, but there is indications that go to a big country to the east of us that would name start with a C, that may be behind this, but of course a big country east of us whose name starts with an R would also be interested in this data. There's no doubt about this. Um, so what data does it have? Of course it has your address, your social security number, um, but also your eye color, your financial troubles, your health situation, your relation troubles, your problems of alcohol abuse, um, and so on and so on. So this is actually extremely valuable information. So it's not only a security problem or privacy problem, sorry, it's also a security problem because this is actually very dangerous for sec security of the US. So what we've seen after 9-11, and this has continued after the attacks in Europe, um, and in spite of the Snowden leaks, that more or less we're still being told by our governments to give up more privacy in exchange for more security. Um, but I think if you look at the OPM bridge, it actually shows that privacy is a security property and the two cannot be separated. The way I like to put it is that we should look at privacy or as big data as pollution. Okay? Putting all your data in public, you can say this is my human right, I can go on Facebook and share everything I do. Well then think of the app Gaydar. App Gaydar appeared, I think, with more than 10 years ago. It determined to which percentage somebody is gay or homosexual. Based on your name, maybe, based on where you live, based on the music you like, based on the books you read, based on the friends you have, and so on. So in fact, this is very unethical research, and I think the gap has been taken down, but of course anybody who has access to the data can still do this. But the interesting thing is that even if you are a straight person who doesn't care about this problem, by leaking your data, you actually help identifying others. And so I think that's why it's like pollution, it's like with having our cars or our making fire in our backyard or having uh, a bad working heating system. It's a collective problem. Privacy is not about my decisions to what I share, it's about overall in society. Privacy is a collective problem and if you give away too much data, others will be harmed even if you get a short-term benefit. So I gave this, I was explaining this in the Netherlands two years ago and somebody made a cartoon which maybe shows it better to you. So we should look at spreading all our data, sharing our data also in terms of pollution. And of course, one of the big beneficiaries of this data is governments. I already mentioned Snowden. So it's now almost six years ago that Snowden documents were leaked. Um, and frankly, it's very disappointing. I thought that um, 
there would be progress, the progress is actually zero. In the US, metadata, which means who you call and where you are, is now not collected by the NSA, but actually is stored at the telcos and the NSA can ask it when they need it. That's the only difference they made in the US. Um, and for the rest, I think many other nation states have been looking at the Snowden documents carefully and are copying the same behavior, which is mass surveillance. So a big plus for um, Snowden documents is that professors have more research time because we can just do Snowden slides and we don't have to make our own anymore. So these are slides which are leaked by Snowden, so NSA slides. Anybody has an iPhone here? So this is an NSA slide about iPhones. It's an internal communication among NSA people. And it says, who knew in 1984 that this would be Big Brother and the zombies would be paying customers? So more or less the NSA said, if you have an iPhone, you're actually a zombie who pays for their own surveillance. And of course, if you're an Android user, it's the same. It doesn't make a difference. Just different slides, which I didn't show. <laughs> So by using a smartphone, you actually pay for your own mass surveillance. That's the reality, and it has not changed. We still use the same technology, if not more intrusive technology, six years later. Um, Obama went on TV and said, um, we're not listening to your phone calls. And maybe for non-Americans, I should explain this, the job of the NSA is to spy on all of us, non-Americans. But the NSA cannot spy on Americans that the FBI has to do, okay? <laughs> and of course, they can also ask GCHQ to do it, their friends, because they're allowed to spy on Americans. But so the Snowden documents show actually that the NSA had been spying on Americans. So Verizon was collecting metadata. And so Obama went on TV and said, we never listened to your phone calls. We only collected metadata, okay? So metadata is who you call, who you send email to, who you chat with, um, but also where you are, that's also metadata, okay? So, and Obama also said, we're gonna stop the friends of friends of friends collection program. What does it mean? It means that the US has a list of about 100,000 people. And if you were a friend of those people, they would collect your data as well. If you were a friend of a friend of this data, they would collect your data as well. If you're a friend of a friend of a friend of somebody, they would also collect your data as well. The improvement was we will stop at friends of friends. I have bad news because I have bad friends. <laughs> okay, so I'm probably a friend of some people that is not liked. Here is my phone, your phone is also in this room now. So you're a friend of a friend. Welcome to the club. <laughs> that's more or less what it means. If you're in this room, that's enough. If you were not on the list with metadata, you actually would be listed. By the way, the Europeans, we have our data retention law, which also forces our governments or forces the telcos more or less to keep all metadata, which means your location, who you talk to, where you, which websites you visit, who you chat with, and so on. So it's extremely sensitive information. Um, it's also collected in Europe. Um, several times, human rights activists went to the highest courts. They won several times. And the response of government is to tweak the law a bit and say it no longer applies. We made it a bit harder to get to the data, and that's it. So I think this is where the battle will be fought. Um, how powerful are these systems or what can you do with it? Well, so this is a tempera system or a ski score deep dive. It's kind of amazing. So the answer to the Snowden documents was this is just targeted surveillance because we will on, we collect everything about everybody, but we'll only ask specific questions. So for example, I have one phone number. So there was a terrorist attack. You have one phone number. So Find all the other devices of this person. Does he also have a tablet, a laptop? Um, which website has this person visited? Who has he talked to, chatted with, emailed? Um, and so, who, who does he work with? And so, this is called targeted surveillance, okay? So, you may know what happened in the Belgacom hack. Um, in Belgacom hack, a sysadmin was actually targeted. What sysadmins do is they store MAC addresses in Excel sheets. So with one command in these systems, you can get all the Excel sheets with MAC addresses in a single country. And the NSA calls this targeted surveillance because they're the very interesting people. They're not targets, but they're on the way to a target because if you can hack the sysadmin, then you can get to any system. 
or find all machines with a bug in Panama. If you try to apply a Microsoft update and it fails, the NSA knows before Microsoft. And they now know you have an unpatched flaw and they can exploit it. Um, or find anybody in Germany who communicates in French and who uses one, any of the following three apps. These are targeted questions. The NSA and GCHU call this targeted surveillance. Okay? Now you can say, well, this is the NSA and this is GCHQ. They're really bad people because they're Anglo-Saxon countries. Um, there is some very interesting reports on Germany. So in Germany, you have the Bundesnachrichtendienst. What they did is they spied on French and German companies. Maybe I should repeat this. They spied on French and German companies and gave this data to GCHQ in exchange for access to those systems. Okay, so more or less our governments collect data about our, their own citizens and their own companies and they give it to the big pool of Tempera or XKS Core Deep Dive in exchange for access. So you see, if Trump is threatening to close access, you know what he's talking about. So our government have access to this too. Of course, not the policeman in Leuven who is, has the complaint of a neighbor that the students have been making too much noise, but some people in our government or our secret services have access to those systems. And the only thing is that Belgium was not found in the Snowden documents, but Germany was found, and this resulted into um, an investigation in the German parliament, and netpolitik.org has written down all the proceedings. If your German is good enough, you can read exactly what happened there. So our own European governments are spying on their own people, give the data to GCHQ to actually be able to allow access to those systems and hack the companies in their own countries or the neighboring countries. So what's happened is very simple. Maybe I should start here. So we have in society government, users and industry, and these days industry is called surveillance capitalism because the Snowden documents show that all the large corporations work together with the US. They have no choice. If you don't collaborate, your CEO goes to jail. It's very simple. And they don't want to do that. But so in the US, people tend to trust companies and distrust government. In Europe, we tend to trust our government more or less, but we distrust companies. And so we have privacy laws in which governments say we will control industry. And in fact, the privacy laws also apply to government. And so we will actually defend rights of individuals against society. But of course, now industry is rolling out big data, IoT, and advertising ecosystem, which is already there. And then we know from Snowden that there is a prison program which gives the NSA access to this data. In the previous slide, you know that your government has also access to this data, likely. So now the government has access to all this data. So why should they stop industry from collecting it? Because the more data industry has, the more data government has as well. So when I grew up in school, I was told that the most horrible society was East Germany because it was a communist society and there was a Stasi spying on everybody. And your family members could be spying on you or your neighbors or people at work. And if you want to feel how it was, you should watch the movie Das Leben der Anderen and you feel how bad it is. And so we were told this is really terrible. A society in which you're surveilled the whole time, this is the most horrible thing. We in the West, we're free, but those poor people, they're being surveilled the whole time. Well, if you look at what we have today with technology, we've now built a similar system, which in the 18th century was called the Panopticon. So Panopticon was a prison designed by Jeremy Bentham, where you had a central tower in which the guards could watch the prisoners all the time. And the idea was, if the prisoners know they can be watched all the time, they will not misbehave. They will not start turning their toothpicks or whatever, or their cutlery into knives to break out, because they can be watched all the time. And in fact, two of those prisons were built um, in the 18th century or 19th century uh, in the UK, not surprisingly. And the prisoners didn't like it. But more or less, we've now built a panopticon with technology and we even carry these devices and we pay for our own surveillance. We pay, we pay several hundred euros, so some people even more than a thousand euros to be surveilled the whole time. That's what we do. And of course, it may give rise to discrimination and fear you may start behaving like society wants, and of course it can be abused at any time. And I don't think we are much enough aware of this. I don't know whether you saw the announcement this weekend, but anybody who wants to go to the US with a visa now has to give their social media accounts. So in the past it was only when you had been to dangerous nations, but from this weekend on, if you want a visa, so not for ESTA, for now, 
you actually have to give all your accounts, which means your email addresses, your LinkedIn account, your whatever Google Plus account, where is this account still, your Facebook account. And so if you lie in this application, this is already punishable. So we're getting very, very much close to this surveillance society. And then on the other hand, governments are actually fighting encryption. Um, I guess crypt, this has been an old story in the sense that governments had control of encryption because it was expensive and it was only used by military, by the government themselves and by the banks. But of course, then encryption became a mass product and our iPhones were protecting us. So, and then of course what happened is, is history. Three and a half years ago, there was a guy shooting 15 people. He burned all his devices except for his government phone and then the FBI asked for access to his phone to Apple. Um, so to actually disable the login mechanism so they could look what was in there. And the FBI actually referred to a law from 1789 about iPhones that actually says that the government has to get access. The legal defense of Apple was that if you force us to do this, tomorrow there will be thousands of police forces on our door asking the same thing. You actually will destroy the whole ecosystem. There will be a back door which will be used by others. You may remember how the story ended. The FBI paid $900,000 to an Israeli firm, probably Celebrite, to hack the iPhone anyway. Um, and there was no information on it. So the FBI dropped the case. And then a few months later, a researcher in Cambridge hacked the same iPhone for $150 of equipment. So the FBI overpaid a bit. That was the only uh, conclusion we can draw from this. But so it's clear that there is a complaint by governments. And this complaint goes back to the early 90s when the US government tried to stop a secure phone being sold for end-to-end -end encryption using triple DES. And the government proposed their own alternative, the Clipper chip, with a backdoor for the government. And we were very happy as academics and industry because we fought together to have this chip stopped. So we're very proud that Clipper was defeated. But of course, from the known documents, the US government just went around encryption, um, as we will see. And they, they actually, we won this battle, but we lost the war big. And this war keeps coming back. So this is Comey when he was still FBI director. We're going dark. Um, also, the French and German ministers of interior say, say the same thing. What they want to say is there is too much encryption. We can't do our police work anymore. Um, the most funny guy is the guy in Australia. He says the laws of mathematics do not apply in Australia. That's his way. But in the meantime, Australia has a law in which companies can actually um, be forced to put a backdoor in systems. And the UK has such a law already as well since several years, the RIP Act. So they can actually force companies to do this. This was voted last December. And the current FBI director actually says, we can't have a stable end state when there is entirely unfettered space beyond the reach of law enforcement. And this again goes about encrypted devices and use of encryption in communications. So in Europe, there are still some people who have some sanity. Um, like ANSIP, uh, vice president of the commission, who says, I'm strongly against backdoors in encrypted systems. If you Google this statement, you always get advertisement of Huawei. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's a, it's a very complex debate, and I'm not going to have it here, because then I will miss my dentist appointment. Um, but more or less, the bottom line is, do you want to access communications? which is what they always complain about, or messaging, or is it metadata? Because they have the metadata already, right? They only complain about the content. Um, is it police finds a USB disk, or maybe somebody, like the San Bernardino case, where somebody dies and then they have his iPhone. But of course, what the police wants to do is real life hacking and go into the phone while you're using it, which is much more intrusive. And so it's important to understand that there is many forms of access, but the police always complains in the press about those things which are least intrusive, but in the laws they write, they actually ask for the most intrusive part. So they don't play a fair debate, in my view. So also Washington Post reported that actually um, the number of cases in which encrypted devices were found, found was actually much less than claimed. So they make claims about this. Uh, but then it turns out to be not 10,000, but less than 7,800. It's still a lot, but still, it's not 10,000 to 100,000. Um, and then, for example, Amazon's recognition tool is actually being used by police forces now. So police now has a vague photo of somebody, 
even in a, in a disco or whatever, they can now go use the Amazon tool and find the name. So they're actually much more powerful than what they could ever do before. Same thing with Salah Abdeslam. Um, he was renting Audis and BMWs. He knew he should not use phones, so he was using throwaway phones and SIM cards, but he rented Audis and BMWs. And so based on this, they could track all his trips because these cars tend to report to headquarters or to whoever, the renting company where they go all the time. So maybe the police of Leuven uh, has to put more cameras because they can't control the rowdy PhD students after they had heavy lectures during the whole day. But I do think that the central police forces have much more power than they ever had. <coughs> okay. So we have lots of encryption. 18 billion, but most of it, and this is a success because when I started in cryptography in 87, there was probably less than a million crypto devices in the whole world. So now there is 18 billion that protect companies or governments against users. Okay, like your bank card. Your bank card is not there to protect you. Your bank card is there to protect your bank against you. So you can't spend more money than you have. Okay, the RM systems is the same thing. Your phone update system, you can say, well, it makes my phone more secure. Yes, but there will be seven updates, but you can't choose which one you want. So in fact, it's not your update, it's their update of your device. So you're not in control as an owner. It's actually security mostly for somebody else. There is lots of encryption that also benefits users, about 14 billion devices. Um, but of course, the phone system is still not end-to-end -to -end today. So if you make a phone call, whether your phone is 2G, 3G, 4G, and also predictably 5G, um, or a fixed-line phone, there is no end-to-end -end security. So phone calls in 2019 are still unencrypted, which means governments, people working for governments, but also businesses can be easily eavesdropped. Okay, then I think where we see some improvement is the mobile devices operating systems that encryption gets better. Okay, this is several billion. Um, a very big ecosystem is browsers and SSL TLS. I will speak about this tomorrow, why there is still many problems with this. Although we keep working on it, there is still many problems. And then you have, of course, the messaging, WhatsApp, um, iMessage and Skype. Skype was peer-to-peer, -peer, European end-to-end -end security. <coughs> Skype was acquired by Microsoft. And within three months, the NSA acquired the ability to tap Skype to Skype calls. Is it a coincidence? You think for yourself. I'm not going to accuse Microsoft of anything. Just think for yourself what happened. Okay, WhatsApp and iMessage use end-to-end -end security, but you should do an experiment. You drop your phone in the toilet. Maybe don't take your nicest phone. Okay, but then you buy a new phone, that's the good news. You log in again and all your messages are there. How can this be end-to-end -end encrypted? They must have a database somewhere with all your messages. Otherwise, there is somewhere some automatic um, extraction from a broken phone. I don't see that happen. Even Apple can't do that. Okay, so apparently you can switch this off, but most of us still have secure messaging with backup in the cloud. So today, um, if you make a phone call, it's not secure. If you use Signal or some other fiber, you may have some chance of some security, but if you use a normal phone call, it's not secure. Apparently, you can bribe for a couple of thousand or ten thousand dollar some African nation operators to get access to the SS7 system, and then you can listen to any phone in the world. You can redirect any phone in the world. You can reprogram any phone in the world. You can do anything. And there's some hackers in the CCC conference who've given a live demonstration three or four years ago. Okay, so our governments keep fighting encrypted calls. On the other hand, they expose themselves, but also all the businesses and all industry to actually unprotected phone calls in 2019. Trend 7 is quantum computers, but Alan will speak more about this, so I'm going to be very fast. So the idea dates back to the 80s, and these things give exponential parallelism. So the first trials were done in the 90s. The biggest one in 2001 was a 7-bit computer built in Stanford, um, which could factor 15. So this is a problem for cryptography, as you will hear this afternoon. Well, not the 15, but larger numbers would be a problem. So most of our modern public key crypto will be broken. For public symmetric crypto, we don't think it's as bad. We just have to double key, key sizes and maybe hash sizes. But so the big problem is for RSA DV Hellman. So the question is, can this thing be built? And, for example, Google plans to show quantum supremacy this year. They build a 72-bit computer. 
IBM is 50 bits, um, and Rigetti is 128 qubits. Um, by the way, there was a recent paper on ePrint that showed that to break RSA 1024, you would need only 512 logic qubits and not 1024. But of course, 512 logic qubits means still a million physical qubits. So it's not for tomorrow, but if it can be done, we have a big problem and a lot of our cryptography has to be replaced. Um, when to switch? I think I will skip this slide. I will leave it to Alan to do this so you can look at it yourself. But so cryptography has advanced a lot by open competitions and I will not give you the history. Uh, but of course, there was the AES competition done by NIST, which gave us the Reindahl result. So what just completed was the CISO competition, authenticated encryption. And then I will speak about this. Um, there is a post-quantum competition um, where people submitted um, 69 schemes. And so about 20 were broken. And so beginning of this year, 26 were chosen for round two. And there is also two from COSIC in there in this competition. And there is also a lightweight competition run by NIST. And there is also interest in standardizing threshold cryptography. So this is happening, but don't hold your, I mean, hold your horses because this competition may last till 2024. So there is no quick solution there. But Alan will speak more about this um, in the next <coughs> days. So final trend. There is more and more hacking happening by nation station states. It's not only NSA, of course. It's also Russia, China, and all the others. Even Belgium proudly adv adv advertised in the summer two years ago that they're looking for hackers. Uh, my advice to the Belgian military is if you live in a glass house, don't throw stones. But that's just my advice. So Snowden summed it up as collect it all, know it all, exploit it all. So this idea that mass surveillance is just collecting data to catch terrorists or to find terrorists before they will do something bad. The Snowden documents show this is a myth. What governments are doing these days is also hacking systems. First for intelligence, but of course the next step is for war. And so there have been, of course, first warm-up battles. Um, Ukraine was an example, but before we had Estonia and Georgia. But it's just coming. And so US has now added a cyber command. NATO will have a cyber command. So cyber war is coming, and this is pretty scary. So it's, of course, not only the NSA. What you see here is all the countries that collaborate in various formats with the NSA. You have the five eyes. Uh, but also, you see Belgium is in the inner circle of the SS Europe. And these people are threatened that if they buy Huawei equipment, they will be kicked out of this thing. Uh, but there is many more nations in there, actually. Also, the CIA is hacking. So this was leaked a bit after Snowden documents that there is a program run by Center for Cyber Intelligence in the CIA called Vault 7, in which they can more or less um, read WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram, and so on, <coughs> not by decrypting it, but by hacking the phone and getting the message from the phone. So if the NSA hasn't hacked you, maybe the CIA has it, and then maybe the FBI. So what should a small nation like Belgium do? So my first advice is rather than hire hackers, hire people to defend your systems, one. And two, if you want to hack stuff, you can contact Hacking Team or Celebrite, or there is many more companies. So Hacking Team um, is the hacking suite for government interception. And they say, we believe, in that fighting crime, we believe that fighting crime should be easy. To quote George Genesis, there is only one kind of state in which fighting crime is easy. We call it the police state. So Hacking Team had tools to control devices remotely and to break into anything. And Hacking Team had many interesting customers. Of course, in Europe, also the campus police of UCSP. So if you go to crypto, beware. Um, but also, of course, countries which are less democratic. How do we know? Hacking Team was hacked. And they lost all their files, all their tools, and all their customer lists. You can go to Wikipedia and look at it. But of course, they're getting business. And so you can question how ethical this is that our governments are supporting these companies that actually are hacking. And they say, of course, we only work with the good guys. That's their, all, their, all their slogan is they only work with the good guys. Okay, so the NSA announced 
two years ago that actually um, more than 95% of their zero days they would make public. So maybe I should brief you for those who don't know what a zero day is or an odd day. This is a new flaw you find in the system for which there is no patch. And of course, if it's a serious one, you can actually take control. So if you find such a flaw, what you can do is you can do responsible disclosure and report it to um, the company. You may even get a big bounty. You can also sell it on the black market and may even get more money. Now, the NSA also buys or collects these things. And so they proudly announce that more than 95% of those they find, they make public. They do not say after how many years. And they also don't say what they do with the ones they don't keep public. So they may still be hacking us. Um, there is more details, for example, so the group in NSA that does this stuff, one of the groups is called the Equation Group, they lost some of their zero days to shadow brokers. And then this actually, pro probably Russian hackers, was then used to create WannaCry, Petya, and not Petya, and they were first used in the attack against Ukraine. So you see what happened is that US hackers find flaws in Microsoft, don't tell Microsoft, but keep the hack, start building tools, then lose those tools, and then those tools are being used by Russia against Ukraine, and then they end up and shut down the health service in the UK. So it's really a scary world out there. Okay, the total cost of this series of ransomware has been estimated to be $10 billion. You shouldn't believe those numbers, but even if they're a factor of five off, it's still scary. And Maersk, the transport company, claims that they lost a quarter billion dollar based on these things. Okay, so also the Americans um, last November just leaked the Russian tools. This is kind of, kind of revenge, of course, they, they can then be used against others, right? This is really very dangerous stuff. So what does Europe do in all this? Um, well, the good thing is that at least the previous commission or the current commission, we don't know about the next commission because there is quite some French and German pressure to change this, said we should not put backdoors on encryption and we should not um, weaken encryption in any way. But they say there is a problem for the police. So 96 people will go to Europol, but then they claim it's 24. There is a typo in the communication, which I'm willing to give credit. Sometimes people make typos, especially in those important places. Um, and so they encourage countries to share their tools and to work together to build tools. Uh, it's still very vague what it is. Is it key search machines? Is it zero days? Uh, is it malware? Is it negotiating a discount with hacking team? So we can get five for the price of three or something? I don't know. So the police is not going dark. They have much more power than they ever had. That's the main message. Again, the Leuven police may have a problem but the national police forces are not going dark. I don't believe anything of this. So I only ask one question is, who will watch these people? Because I don't think, I think it's an illusion to actually claim we can stop this. They're doing it now. It's very hard to take away such a power. Now I've been in Belgium to some of these people who supervise these police forces. They're very wise people. They're retired judges. I think they're very competent in the sense of have a very good understanding of the law and society, but what they don't understand is technology. I think that's a very big problem. If we give these powers to our police forces, to our governments, we should actually have very smart people watching them, make sure they don't abuse this power. Okay. So I hope you're not depressed from this because I try to cheer you up on Monday morning. Um, so I will not cover all my slides, but that's not a problem. So. What can we do about this? Well, first thing is we architect things. We put everything in the cloud. Um, and maybe we should not do this. We should keep data more local. It's actually possible. And there is occasionally initiatives where there is no deliberate strategy. We should come from the top to actually keep data local. I mean, this device has more power than a Cray from the 80s, right? It has four processors. Um, it has 64 gigabyte story storage, you can do everything on it. Still, this device is designed in such a way that it has to send everything to the cloud to find out which advertisements I want to see. First, I don't want to see advertisements, that's one thing. But if I have to see them, this device has enough knowledge to tell somebody else this guy likes A and not B. My data does not need to leave this device to actually decide that. Right? And I'm happy to give that, if that's what they really want to show me, advertisement. I'm happy to run some program that or even fill in some form that will tell them what I want to see and what I don't want to see. 
But so it's about the architecture. It's like Skype. Skype was first decentralized and was made centralized. That's one thing. So you'll hear more about computer security from Frank, so I will skip that. Uh, communication security, we'll hear more about this as well. So people try to look at the protocols. Uh, I'll speak more about that tomorrow. Uh, so Frank will speak more about computation security, computer security. So how you can make computers more secure. So this is a long-term task. You have secure computation and secure communication. CompuSec and ComSec. And so as much of the course is devoted to this, I will not rush to these details. I want to just finish with a few comments um, on the changing role of cryptography. So, of course, if you want to secure communications, cryptography is essential. If you want to protect data on your USB disk or in the cloud, cryptography is essential. But the latest trend has been we can also protect data while it's being processed. And I cite here just one paper, and Charlotte is in the room, and Frederick will lecture this afternoon about genome-wide association on encrypted data. So if you want to find out more, you can speak to them. So in general, it's possible to keep, stop data and data on the cloud and keep it local and do the local, the local processing. It's re-architecting systems. Of course, it requires changing of business models. Nigel will speak about multi-party computation. So what you do there is everybody keeps their own data in their devices or in maybe their home cloud or their trusted server. And then together you compute value on the data. It's already used today by Google, together with companies, to decide profiles about users while keeping sensitive company data of Google and the businesses um, protected. So this is, this is something which was science fiction in the 70s, proof of concept in the 80s, first test in 90s, 2000s. Today there are several companies selling this technology, and Nigel will speak about this. So computing on encrypted data. Um, so another variant is you store your data <coughs> in the cloud, and then you can do simple computations on them. You can't do anything, but some basic computations, averages and variances are easy, but you can do um, slightly more complex stuff. So, and then to wrap up, if you think of all these backdoors, if you think about it, if we want to get rid of those in 10 or 20 years, the only solution will be to have open systems because everybody puts backdoors in everybody's systems, in hardware, in software. So if we really want to have a secure society, we need open systems, of course, with effective governance. So you actually want to then make sure that it's being checked. So I'm not saying that open software is better or closed software is bad. It's just if we want to go for the future, I think we should have open systems. That's the only way to be able to trust systems and make sure we don't have all these backdoors. If you look at IT systems today, they've changed the power in society. How it should be is that people with a lot of power should be transparent and normal users should have privacy. That's what privacy law says. And what we have achieved with technology is that if you're a user of this thing, you're fully transparent to the cloud providers and what they do with it, that's their business secrets. So in fact, the powerful in the current technology are opaque and the normal users are fully transparent. And so I think we should work on this to fix this. By rethinking architectures, we should focus more on computer security. Because network security, I'm not saying it's solved, but that is a lot easier. Uh, we should think more of these powerful adversaries that actually find flaws and will not tell you, that put in chips while your device is being shipped, the famous Cisco picture. Um, so think about this and think of open technologies. I'm going to stop here and rush off to my dentist. Uh, I hope you have a nice coffee break and a nice course, and I'll see you all back um, tomorrow morning. Thank you.